Pels fans, welcome to another episode of The Bird Calls, a birth child of SB Nation's The Bird Rights Podcast. Now, today we are welcoming back the Lords of Summer, Ali Cassell and Kevin Berrios. Happy weekend, you crazy kids. What's going on, Preston? What's going on, man? Now, Ali, did I get that title right? Oh, man, whatever. You've been, I've been listening <laughs> to all your pods, and I've got Overlord and this and that. Man, I'm just Ollie. <laughs> all right. I think, I think we're more of the boys of bummer than the boys, boys of Yeah, bummer. there we go. I always think of Brian Adams when I think of you guys, so that's apt. Uh, today, you guys, we actually have some very late-breaking news. We're recording this on a Friday night, as you probably have guessed. And we just received a tweet from the man himself, DeMarcus Cousins, who responded facts to the tweet of Richie Rich underscore CLMG when he wrote, what if Carmelo went to NOLA with Boogie and AD dot, 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 laud, and Boogie simply wrote below facts, and Twitter, as we know it, has lost its collective mind. Ali and Kevin, uh, let's start with Kevin. Is this a realistic possibility? We've, we've heard a lot of talk in, in the past week from Alvin Gentry and DeMarcus Cousins talking about uh, what a substantial effect he's had on bringing free agents to New Orleans. Could this be something happening down the pipeline? And would you be excited? Uh, I don't think it's realistic. I mean, but I didn't think getting Cousins was realistic. So, I mean, if it happens, I mean, mathematically, there's a way you can make it happen. But I just don't see it realistically happening. If it did, it would be pretty incredible. I mean, I'm not like super Carmelo fan but come on I mean like that you're adding another at least you know top 30 player and at our major area of weakness which is the three and then also it sort of solves that backup uh big problem because he can play four as well um so it's all two problems give us you know incredible scoring you know spacing would no longer be an issue uh sharing the ball might be an issue defense would go down a little bit but um you know i mean it would be incredible it'd be ridiculous not to be excited about adding carmelo to the team it's just there's no way we can give new york anything they would want if you're mellow i think you would want to come here i mean why not you already got two superstars another two other guys who were on an all played all-star level before um so i mean i think it would be exciting for him also it's just uh, there's just nothing conceivable that we could do unless, you know, behind the scenes, we knew that uh, Ashik was maybe, uh, you know, going to be declared medically disabled and not be able to play with whatever he's got going on. And then, you know, they could get his rights and then, you know, waive them without, you know, salary cost or whatever and, you know, put together a bunch of picks or something. But I just don't see anything that would entice New York to send him here. Now, Ali, we've been hoodwinked by this kind of a Twitter explosion before. Solomon Hill, back in the middle of June, uh, famously wrote, let me see what PG is doing. And we all uh, pictured a world where Paul George was on his way to New Orleans. But with that being said, it it is very apt what uh, Kevin was just saying about Ashik, who has been suffering an illness. We're going to talk about that later. And I was also going to bring up later in this podcast about how we've got a lot of redundant wing players right now. We've got Ian Clark, Etwan Moore, Jordan Crawford, all of whom seem to do the same thing thing we've got seven guards on the roster right now and you can't help but wonder maybe ian clark that move was made with the idea that each one more was going to be sent in trade kind of like this one is there any universe where this could be conceivable well i'm doing i'm playing with espn trade machine right now as we speak and the best deal that i see that would make pelicans fans go into frenzy is we ship out solomon hill and omar sheik and we get carmelo anthony According to the trade machine, that's plus six wins for the Pelicans, minus eight for New York. Um, yeah, it sounds good to me. No, but in all honesty, I'm with Kevin. I don't see this being realistic. And as you mentioned, with all the guards on the roster, it'd be great to be able to maybe ship one or two out and kind of diversify the roster a little more. But again, I, I'm not seeing it. Etchwan Moore, he, he's kind of a valuable trade chip and courting a lot of eyes. You know, he's a useful player. His contract isn't bad. But I just have a feeling that Del Demps is kind of kind of on board with him, just like with Solomon Hill. I don't think he wants to move either of those two guys unless it would be in a windfall, like a Carmel Anthony. And the likelihood of that, to me, is honestly close to zero. You mentioned DeMarcus Cousins happened, and that's true. We've also got to realize that Carmelo Anthony, he's uh, 
he's kind of what, what I find interesting is he found he says that he really wants to go to the Houston Rockets, but recently there's word that he doesn't want to go to the Cleveland Cavaliers. So would he even want to come to New Orleans? I mean, if he doesn't want to go and play with LeBron, uh, why would he want to come to New Orleans? So there's a, so so many things to talk about there, so many issues to discuss that we don't even have a clue on where to begin. Uh, so it is kind of yeah, fantasy but, talk. It's fun talk. What's that, Kevin? But, go ahead. Kyrie doesn't want to play with LeBron either. You know what I mean? There might be <laughs> something there that, you know, personality. I mean, I know they're friends off the court, but maybe, you know, there's like friends that I have that I love that are really close friends, but I definitely wouldn't want to go into business with them. You know what I mean? So it might be one of those things too. Yeah, it's very true. But to answer your question though, uh, Preston, I think there would definitely have to be a third team involved. But my favorite thing about all this possibly going down would be how would Chris Paul feel that Carmelo Anthony ends up in New Orleans instead? <laughs> I would love to see his face and Eric Gordon's and everybody else that used to play for New Orleans and kind of spurn the city, you know, to move on to better, greener pastures. But instead, we end up with the guy they want. So that, to me, would be probably the highlight. The reason why I think it's not completely out of the spectrum, obviously we have all of our picks going forward. That still wouldn't be enough when you uh, take into account the the salary that we'd have to match in sending to New York that they would, uh, by all accounts, want nothing to do with. Even with Etuan Moore, we'd have to package some form of Solomon Hill, Ashik, Agenza, stuff that they wouldn't want. Even if we did throw in Czech Diallo, now you've just got so many moving pieces, they'd have to ship uh, back equal weight. But if there was some way, including a third team, that we could relinquish them of uh, Noah's contract, I think he's got $18 million per year for the next three years. If there's some way we could alleviate that stress from them, I, I think it is conceivable. I, I don't think they would mind taking on Solomon Hill and Omar Ashik if somehow we could get Noah off their books. Now, of course, that would be a complete disaster. And this is all fun, you know. Odds are none of this is going to happen. Like I said, Solomon Hill had a quote on Twitter just like this one six weeks ago. So it's speculative, and we enjoy it. And frankly, there's not a whole lot else to talk about. But let's just strike what I just said from the record, because there's so much to talk about, like all the national attention that the Pelicans are actually getting with additions like the polarizing Rondo to go along with the Prince who was promised, Anthony Davis, the Mountain to Marcus Cousins, as well as newfound champion of Westeros, Ian Clark. Media types at ESPN and The Ringer just just can't help but they are mercilessly just beating on us. We've had recent comments by uh, Jalen and Jacoby saying we're going to trade to Marcus Cousins in five months. Kevin Pelton having us falling out of the playoff race. Haley O'Shaughnessy uh, basically saying that like this is Frankenstein's monster going wrong. Nate Duncan and Danny LaRue gave us a D for the offseason. Ali, let's start with you. Where is the national media going right with everything that's been going around? And where are they just uh, unabashedly wrong? Well, they're going right with because it is an experiment. Uh, You you take all these players as a collective home, put them on a team that has been unsuccessful ever since Alvin Gentry got here. Of course, there should be reason for a lot of doubt. Um, They're not not wrong about that. What I don't like is, is what they're basing it on. They're basing it on, like, for instance, with Boogie last year. They're basing on the fact that he and Anthony Davis didn't win a lot of games together. Now, I've been – I don't know how many times I can say it, but if you look at the lineup that those two had to play with, and this is on top of uh, the fact that these guys were not familiar with one another. Boogie was playing kind of hurt with that Achilles, so he was not in top shape. Um, and then we had a bunch of players surrounding them that just didn't want to be aggressive, take the open shot. And so, yeah, the guys didn't win a lot of games. Now, everybody seems to be basing it on this. Now, what I would like to know is why can't we base it on, on all the good things that happened last year? For instance, Drew Holiday, Solomon Hill, Anthony Davis, and DeMarcus Cousins formed a great core four. When you threw in a shooter with those guys, the Pelicans were world beaters. And, that, and that's just that's one more in Jordan Crawford. Now, let's just say it's Ian Clark or an improved another player on the roster. And the fact that we now have depth, we don't have to rely on 10-day contracts. They've got a full training camp. Suddenly everybody's in better shape. Maybe a player or two improved their shot. We've seen it happen before. Uh, players in their 20s improve. I mean, look at the player or teams that kind of have, have always had a trajectory upwards, like Utah, like uh, I don't know who else you want to toss out there. But it's not inconceivable that the Pelicans could do well, but yet everybody's just focused on our bad record. The, you know, whatever you want to throw into it. But the fact that they're just basing it on these past, um, experiences and so forth without really dissecting what the Pelicans have going forward bothers me. 
And that's why I'm going to be writing a couple articles coming up as to where I think people should be a lot more optimistic about the team. Ooh, I like that drop on the birdrights.com. You guys make sure you go over there and you stay tuned for Ali Cassell's articles on this. Kevin, uh, let's turn it over to you. What was some of the most enraging stuff you heard this week? And uh, what stuff did you actually think might have been right on the money? Well, um, I mean, I, I, uh, I mostly, most of those stories that you mentioned, I'm mostly familiar with the Jalen and Jacoby. I listened to that one. Um, I just kind of read other people's reviews of the other things. So I ha- I don't have a lot of firsthand knowledge of that stuff. But, um, you know, on Jalen and Jacoby, they said the starting three was Etwan Moore. And, you know, maybe he could win that in training camp. But, you know, we can pretty much assume that Solomon Hill will be back at the three. I mean, it's one of those things national media guys don't get to spend a lot of time watching teams that aren't that good, you know, and we weren't that good last year, even though we got interesting after the boogie trade. Um, I mean, it's just a reality. I mean, they, they are producing multiple shows are appearing on multiple shows, have you know, personal lives. I mean, it's hard to keep up with the Pelicans in our lives with what we have going on. So imagine them trying to keep up with it. So, taking what they have to say as gospel is a little bit, you know, you shouldn't do it because they don't get to watch the games like we do or really look past numbers or highlight clips or records and see how things fit together. Um, You know, when they talked about, they talked about Anthony Davis mentioning, uh, you know, bringing in the Denver system and how, you know, Nurkic and Jokic played together. Um, and how that didn't work out, which it was when I first initially heard the Chris Finch hiring stated for that reason, I was a bit concerned too. I was like, well, they just traded off mm-hmm. Nurkic because it wasn't working. But, you know, then I got to understand it was more about, you know, featuring Jokic and getting the ball in his hands and moving him. But the thing is, is that AD and uh, cousins are way more dynamic than Nurkic is. You know, uh, they have much more shooting and are better defenders. They're more skilled players. So, like, it, it's not really like you can compare it. The only thing they really have in common is that they're around seven feet tall, you know. Um, and then, like, the 70% chance they gave on cousins being traded at the deadline. I mean, I just don't see that. Um, he seems incredibly committed to the team. He seems really excited. He's in great shape. He's, you know, I mean, he's sending out tweets like this today. He's like actively recruiting people. It doesn't seem like a right. guy who's not planning on being here beyond this year, you know. And yeah, and Kevin, 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 let me just say real quick. And one thing, what have we learned about Del, Del Demps? He will not trade a player in his final year of his contract, even if the team has is like ten games under five hundred or whatever it was with Ryan Anderson. If he, if he held on to Anderson and Eric Gordon you really think DeMarcus Cousins is going to get shipped off no no sorry I just had to put that in there because I just think these people like you mentioned don't really understand the situation here and the pieces and how they function so yeah I think it's a fantasy land 70 percent I think it's more like 95 percent he stays so right <laughs> I mean it would have to be I I feel like it would have to be a total disaster for them to try to trade them you know we'd have to be a good like 15 games or something under 500 at the deadline to to try to trade uh, Cousins. Yeah, I'll take it a step further. I think it would take DeMarcus Cousins asking for a trade. I don't care how bad the record is. Unless he says, you know, Del Dante, I think is this going to work and I need to be shipped out. That's the only thing that's going to cause him to leave town. You know, I mean, if if you're 15 games under 500 and Cleveland is like, we'll trade you Kyrie Irving for DeMarcus Cousins, you might do it. Yeah, and that's the scenario. Right. Yeah, that, I like that one. <laughs> I, I don't think that would ever happen. Nobody's going to trade uh, Kyrie Irving with still two years left on his contract for six months of uh, one of the most difficult players in the NBA. But I, I want to go back to something that Ali just said. Uh, I was about to get into some of these quotes that we've been discussing just now. Uh, but but every time we get comfortable and we start making predictions on on the season, the, the roster seemingly has been solidified. Then all of a sudden Rondo happens and Ian Clark happens. And uh, you were talking about trades. I, I don't think there's any universe in which Boogie gets traded, even if he asked to be traded. I don't think you can give Dell Demps permission to to make that choice because he's been here seven years. 
this is his last season. He's going down in the flames of glory. If if that should happen, Dell Demps has to be removed, and either Mickey has to pull the trigger himself, or he has to bring somebody into town to make the decision for him. But let's just say that Boogie rides out the year. We're, we're doing very well. The Pelicans have been very quietly assembling a bevy of, of very movable contracts. Um, other than Solomon Hill and Omar Ashik. after that, you've got Etwan Moore at eight. You've got Ajinsa at uh, just under five. You've got Pondexter and expiring. You've got just one year of Rondo. You've got, I think the second year of Miller is a team option. 1.7 on Crawford, 1.5 on Clark. Check Diallo is very movable. Frank Jackson is very movable. Is it very possible that there, there, there's still something that's going to happen in the next six months uh, outside of our, our big three, Ollie? Well, yeah, there's that chance for sure. Um, if things don't get off to that good start that Travis was talking about in your last podcast, um, if they get up to that slow start, you better believe Del Demps is going to try and do something. And with all those movable contracts, yeah, there's there's some there's potential for a move there. Um, but as of now, I, you can't expect that. I think they've assembled the type of roster they want. All the players are, you know, saying nothing but praises. I can't remember last time so many players for New Orleans are so you know all in on this season, so to speak. Uh, especially the, all the top guys. Um, I don't know. I just truly don't see any move being made unless they get off to that bad start. But as you said, they've got Dell Demps has that in his back pocket with all those movable contracts. Um, if that needs to happen, then it'll happen. And you know, they'll have to examine the market on who's available and who they think they need potentially to help this team write the ship. But until then, I'm, I'm not even, gonna, I, you can't think that far down the road. You know, <laughs> we're still, you know, a couple months away from any meaningful games. And people are already thinking the Pelicans and kind of like, like we've talked about already, kind of using these vague reasons or, you know, inadequate explanations. So we first got to get to that point and explain that and try and get around that before we can start talking about other Lego pieces being moved here. I'm going to hop over to Kevin for a second. The reason I'm bringing up this point is because uh, the the Pelicans are now very heavy at the guard position with players who who think they're going to see minutes outside of um, possibly Frank Jackson. Uh, and everybody's been labeling Ian Clark as as this shooter that the Pelicans have have long been missing. Uh, he averaged over 37% on the season last year. I think he's a career 36 point shooter. He is a 40% catch in. Uh, uh, three-point shooter last year. Very good. But right now, his numbers are only good enough for fifth on the team if you're also including Dante Cunningham, who very obviously is not currently with the team. You've got Drew Holiday, who was shooting above 40% before Boogie came to town. I'm expecting that to go at least somewhere close to that number. Uh, you had Cunningham at 39. You had Etwan Moore at 37. You had DeMarcus Cousins at 38. And you had Jordan Crawford at 39. Right now, we have a lot of guards who are doing the same thing. Kevin, uh, who's to say that all of these guys are going to get minutes next year? Yeah, I mean, that's one of my concerns is uh, we're very guard heavy. And I, I say going into the, you know, during the off season, I thought uh, being big was uh, what we should be focusing on and our identity and creating a, a mismatch for the opponent. And I'm a little bit worried that we're, uh, lose some of that without having Dante Cunningham. I think if we had Cunningham, he would help, you know, give us depth at the three and as a reserve big man, it would solve two problems. Um, so I'm still hoping he comes back. Um, the Ian Clark signing for me, I know a lot of people are really excited about getting him. I'm just kind of ho-hum about it. I mean, I, like you mentioned earlier, him coming along is taking minutes from Moore and from Crawford. and the thing is, is like, he's a fine player. He's, you know, I'm glad we didn't pay him what people thought we would have to pay him to get him. I'm glad, you know, it's a minimum contract, so it's not a big deal. But uh, like the way I look at it is it's like if you go to the store and you buy a very comfortable, nice T-shirt that fits well, you like it, it gets in your rotation. But what you really needed was a suit to get to the next level. You know, it's like kind of that kind of move. Um, so. I mean, I'm not hating on the guy. I just don't didn't see such a huge need for him when we had other issues and we already had guys on the roster that could fill that hole. Um, so I know, like you had mentioned, you know, trying to get to an eight-man rotation, but I think the problem with having all the guards that we have is that it's almost impossible to, to run an eight-man rotation because there's just – you need to insert more size and also get these guys some minutes. So um, 
you know, I think it's hard to go without a 10 man or nine, at least a nine man rotation to make the, you know, the space, the, the, the dynamics of the floor work, especially if you're trying to keep, you know, AD and DeMarcus Cousins on the court all the time, you know. Um, so it forces you to play Hill at the four, you know, maybe play Miller more, um, play Di- Diallo. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I'd rather uh, have focused on getting Dante in first, and then if you get Clark at, also, then that's land yet. But um, for me, Clark, he's a good shooter, but is he that great of a shooter because he was wide open all the time? playing in Golden State. What I do like about him is his cutting, which Dante also provided. So that's something that is going to be crucial, but I don't I don't know I, if I'm going to cut anybody's minutes, it would be Clark's because I really value more. I think he's a very good player. I think he was a little bit underused last year. I think you're going to see him really shine this year. And then Crawford, if, if last year wasn't a fluke, um, with his mentality is something that we need. Um, so I'm excited about that. But, you know, Clark isn't a real NBA player, which we've had to rely on 10-man contracts before to fill those those minutes. So it's definitely an upgrade, but it just – it creates problems in the sense that we were we were really missing – uh, still missing a backup big and, and another uh, three. Let's let's keep this thought going with Ali. Uh, right now we have we have twelve players who are pretty sure they're going to get substantial minutes, and where the big question marks are, like Kevin just said, at small forward, where we have uh, question marks and Darius Miller and Quincy Pondexter behind Solomon Hill, and we don't really know who our our main third big is going to be. It's uh, going to right now it's a battle between Jack Diallo and Alexis Agensa. Right now we have twelve players outside of Ashik and. Um, sorry, uh, Quincy Pondexter, who are pretty sure they're going to get substantial minutes. When things get tight and we're in a must-win situation, most teams stick to an eight- or nine-man rotation. Ali, who's who's your eight- or nine-man rotation for the Pelicans right now? Okay, well, it's going to be the starters, Holiday, Davis, Cousins, Hill, and Rondo. Uh, then you're looking at Moore is going to be very important, the sixth guy, so to speak. And see, I differ from Kevin. I think Clark's a big deal. I think his mentality, his scoring prowess, his aggressiveness, so to speak, was really lacking on a team. Now, granted, Moore was kind of injured a lot last season, so I don't know truly if Moore can, you know, give us a little more on that offensive end. But all I noticed a lot last season was when the team kind of struggled with searching for a basket, it seemed like no player wanted to grab the bull by the horns. I think Clark can be that guy, just like Jordan Crawford. But the biggest question with Jordan Crawford is, He's had a lot of experience in this league, and a lot of people are saying that last season might be a little bit of a small sample size, and that's very well true. That may be the case. He may not be that proficient from the outside, so he's a very big liability on the defensive end. If he's not hitting that three, not making plays, setting up Davis for easy dunks or just switching the three when he's open, he's a liability out there, and therefore Clark can fill in that role. So as I said, Clark's my seventh guy. Then – this is where it gets interesting. Will Dante Cunningham come back? If he does, he's kind of that eighth guy. Because like Kevin was saying, we need another big behind Davis and Cousins. And no, I don't think Diallo's ready. Even though he looks great and I want to see him get his minutes, I'm hoping that at best he Gentry will put him in uh, in kind of blowouts or you know in, in kind of situational minutes. But I don't think there's any way the coaching staff's ready to give him Cunningham type of minutes. So it has to be Cunningham. If not, you know, I'm looking at Quincy Pondexter and uh, Darius Miller. One of those two are going to have to be asked to play sometimes that power forward position going in for Cunningham. So whichever one of those guys shines early in training camp, uh, preseason, and start of the season, they could legitimately be that eighth guy. Kevin, uh, expound on that a little bit more. Uh, that's that's the biggest question mark that we've been talking on this podcast all week is who's going to fill those uh, small ball four minutes between Solomon Hill, Darius Miller, and uh, Quincy Pondexter. We don't even know if we're going to see Quincy Pondexter this season. Talk about who you have the most faith in right now. Do you think Czech Diallo is ready for 20 minutes per game? Do you think Darius Miller is ready for that kind of responsibility? You know, I think relying like I really like Quincy Pondex there I think he's a really quality person I think he was a good basketball player 
and I hope he gets to come back and play basketball. I really do. I know he's working very hard on it, but you know, I live in the CBD and I saw him grocery shopping in the Rouses with a sleeve on his knee, which isn't very promising, especially after like two years of being gone, you know? So I, I'm right now until I see him on the court, I'm going to assume he's not playing again. Um, so that leaves uh, Diallo and uh, Miller, which uh, are two big question marks. You know, D- Miller, uh, you know, he didn't, he wasn't able to make it. Went overseas. Hopefully, he honed his game. You know, apparently his three-point shots good. Um, you know, I think he has a little bit of an advantage now that the league has gone smaller. He can play power forward where he won't get killed for his lack of athleticism which he did, you know, in his first stint in the NBA when he was trying to play the three and the two. Um, now he's playing four mainly probably and a little bit of three. Um, so, I, you know, his shooting is also – his shooting and his IQ and his experience gives him the advantage over Diallo. Diallo's physical gifts gives him the advantage over – is his advantage over Miller. So it just kind of depends on which one um, – and offset their weaknesses the most in in training camp and I agree with Ali like I don't really think that Diallo is ready yet um, last year I wanted to give him more minutes when it seemed like we were more of a you know when we're more of a process kind of team trying to build something still but now that we got boogie it's all about you know forward and winning so I I agree with uh, him in the sense that I think Diallo needs to you know it would be nice to get him minutes in real games, but I think he's still more of a G League and, you know, victory cigar uh, kind of minutes for him at the moment. And I would trust Miller a little bit more just because of his experience and because he can space the floor uh, with uh, his improved three-point shot. I'm going to echo a little bit of what both of you said. Uh, I don't think Czech Diallo is, is ready for this. I don't think he's ready for 20 minutes a game. Uh, he's, he's getting better and better offensively, but he's just a liability defensively. And if he's that third big off the bench, he's going to be, he's going to have to be the rim protector. There's not going to be anybody out there who can help him save Solomon Hill. Who's not a great rebounder, although he probably will have Rondo on the, on the floor to help with him. Uh, but what I do want to agree with Ali about is uh, something the Pelicans have already said is that they really value Ian Clark's postseason experience and Steve Kerr called him one of his favorite players to coach in the two years that he was there. So I think they want Clark on the floor, not necessarily because he's better than each one more, but because they, they value his leadership and they value his experience. And the reason I say more over Crawford is because like Ali was saying, um, you know, a lot of the guys were, were afraid to make that shot. Jordan Crawford was never afraid to take the shot. And not only that, but just when we hit, expected him to, you know, clank one off the rim, uh, the irrational confidence guy, man, they go in. They, it feels like they go in every time. It feels like it doesn't matter where he is on the court. When he shoots the ball, odds are it's going to get in. And he also had such great on-court awareness to me. He had these uh, these uh, fabulous passes to Anthony Davis, these, you know, and ones, these, uh, you know, it, it almost looked like no look pass. I'm not trying to compare him to Steve Nash. All I'm saying is that this guy is not afraid to make a play offensively, where some of these guys like uh, Etwan Moore and Drew Holiday are, are a little bit um, more tentative on that uh, end of the floor, uh, should we say. So I do think that, like Ali said, Ian Clark's got to be out there. And I think Jordan Crawford has to be out there. And that might be a situation where Etwan Moore gets squeezed out. And that's why I consider him, of all these guys, to to be a trade candidate. But guys, let's move on to some of the more fun stuff this week. We've had a lot of quotes given our way from Alvin Gentry, Anthony Davis, especially Boogie Cousins. Let's start with Boogie. We've had a lot of quotes from, uh, I want to be a GM. I think I could be GM of the year. We're going to surprise a lot of people this season. We want to win. I like where I'm at. Ali, what was your favorite thing that Boogie said this week? Hmm. There's a lot of things you said because it's all been positive. I mean, this guy... Is, is like pumping sunshine here in New Orleans, you know, nonstop. For all the haters, I don't think they can stand up to Boogie right now. Mr. Seven Foot, he, he's just excited about this upcoming season. So, favorite one, I think it honestly it is with this whole GM stuff. He is developing one hell of a bond with Del Dems, it sounds like. I got a chance to interview him last week, and I'm going to publish an article in about a couple of weeks regarding it. But, yeah, he told me the same thing. Uh, the main thing is he – instigate a lot or help you know facilitate a lot of these 
uh, free agent signing here, including Rajon Rondo and Ian Clark. And the fact that Dell Demps has taken him come under his wing, he said, and he's asked a lot of questions. Dell Demps has been very receptive, and they bounce ideas back and forth all the time. For instance, Bookie told me that Dell Demps gives him a lot of scenarios, and Bookie gives him his input, whether it's, you know, whether it's a real scenario or not, I have no idea. Whether uh, Del Demps actually takes, you know, what Boogie says under uh, advisement or not, we don't know. But the fact that he's built up this repertoire and he's only been here since February, I think that's astounding. You know, so that to me is, I guess, the biggest thing because it, it goes above and beyond what Boogie wants. In fact, he wants to be a GM someday. It's the fact that it shows how tight, how close he's gotten ready to this organization. And you know, as you mentioned, uh, what was it? He's also had positive things said about him by Alvin Gentry and the one thing that I caught was Alvin Gentry said DeMarcus Cousins never felt that he never developed a bond in his six and a half seven years in Sacramento as to where he's already got it here in New Orleans I think that's a huge positive uh so even if the Pelicans maybe don't make the playoffs there may be a chance they can resign him you know it opens up a lot of these doors that everybody's already closed off when we should actually consider maybe them still open I think that's a real big deal now, Kevin, you can go back to some of the stuff Boogie said if you want to touch upon that, but I really want to get your take on something else because I already know that you have some insight on it. Um, Anthony Davis had a lot of quotes this week as well. One of them is that he's tired of losing. He's very excited about what's happening this season. But one thing that I want to touch upon, and it's just because it's been brought up several times by Jamel McMillan, among others, is he said in regards of Drew pairing up with Rajon Rondo, giving Drew an opportunity to get off the ball he was on the ball la- la- a lot last year. Now it gives him a chance to go out there and focus on whatever he needs to focus on. He's tried to get guys involved and at the same time be aggressive. I know that's probably kind of tough when you're a scoring guard. Kevin, this is what Anthony Davis said. He doesn't think of Drew Holiday as a point guard. And we heard Jamel uh, on, on our podcast as well as Kumar's discuss how he, he never wants to put too much onto Drew Holiday's plate. Kevin, why do we keep hearing that that we can't overwhelm our $126 million point or, excuse me, scoring guard? The thing that's so funny about all of this is, like, I've never considered Drew Holiday a scoring guard. I mean, mm-hmm. I always viewed him – as a point guard, he he doesn't he doesn't excite me as a scorer. You know, he doesn't attack the lane. He doesn't um, beat his man off the dribble. He doesn't really create a great shot for himself. He's not great in catch and shoot. Um, to me, his strength was always playing great defense, being an above average uh, playmaker, getting other people involved, deferring a little bit, sometimes too much. So I don't know. I always just felt like it was like weird that they were always trying to cast this, um, you know, scoring guard mentality on him or a scoring guard persona on him, which I never thought fit. But that's where we are now. I mean, with the Rondo signing, he's obviously slid over to the two for sure, where he's going to be mostly, I mean, he'll initiate offense as well, but with uh, Cousins and Rondo and Crawford and Moore and Clark, you know, he doesn't have to do it as much and we'll see how that goes maybe I'm wrong maybe he'll flourish in that role but you know I haven't seen much out of him I think like when I think of a scoring guard I think of an alpha dog mentality and I don't think that Drew Holiday has that um except for in negotiations apparently like I mean that's where all of his aggression is you know like his contract negotiation reminded me of a situation I came in uh dealt with at work um and my day or night job, whatever you want to call it, I'm a bartender at Porta Call, and I get a phone call at work. I answer the phone, and the person's like, uh, "With the steak, I get uh, a potato." And I was like, "Yeah, you get a potato and a salad." And they were like, uh, "I can't get anything else other than a potato." And I was like, "Well, all we really have is potatoes and salads. So, I mean, you could get like two salads." And they're like, I can't get anything else like like a pork chop. And I wanted to see where this was going. So I said, so you want a steak, a pork chop, and a salad? And they said, no, I want a steak and two pork chops. And then I said, well, we don't have pork chops. And then they told me to F off and hung up, um, which I think is kind of like, Drew Holiday's negotiating with Del Demps, you know, that, I mean, if you, 
if you're getting rid of all your responsibility that you had and you're getting you're demanding this huge contract and then still having to sleep on it you know it's crazy i don't i don't know i mean look i like drew i think he's in, integral in in our defensive schematic and i think our perimeter defense is going to be incredible this year but he's definitely not worth what he's getting paid and i just don't understand where his negotiating power and aggression comes from because i would love to see that on the court Ali, do you have any insight on this quote by Anthony Davis? Uh, which one exactly? Uh, the just the one, one, the one echoing Jamel's uh, quotes that, uh, you know, we can't afford to give Drew Holiday too much on his plate. If anything, we want to take things off of his plate. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I do see that because let's face it, Drew Holiday, um, if you remember all last year, and I'm with Kevin, I see this guy strictly as a point guard as well. He never once was the type of guy that's, tried to take the you know carry the, everything on his shoulders for like about three four five possessions where he's going to go ahead and try and score on all those three four five possessions so yeah I think in Anthony Davis's mind and a lot of other players mind that they think Anthony or they they see Drew, the potential in Drew Holiday and this guy I've seen him in practices and in pregame he can shoot with either hand and make shots he can be off balance you name it he's got such a good like touch yeah, it's funny how it's barely ever evident in games. And the reason is, according to the coaching staff, is there's just too much on his plate. That he, especially when Cousins showed up, he was just so worried about getting these guys involved, making sure they get theirs, that he just didn't know when to look for his. And I swear, I remember a few instances where he's got a wide open layup, and he's trying to force a pass either in the boogie or AD in the lane, and it, it resulted in the turnover. Or the guy was so overwhelmed, he's catching a simple out-of-bounds play. Nobody's on him, around half court, and he kicks it off his shin. I mean, there, there's something to this, you know? Players in the NBA with that kind of skill level don't make those type of mistakes, not as often as we saw out of Drew. So with Anthony Davis saying that, yeah, I think there's something to that. I think they did want Drew Hall to be relaxed and never once, at least last season, was he that. He was never relaxed. He had... He was carrying around too much stress, whether it was from more family related or, you know, the weight of the shoulders of the organization that he had to be the guy to get the team going. I don't know. We don't know. We'll probably never know. But it make it makes sense, Preston, why they're trying to just, you know, ease that burden off Drew. And I think their hope is that not only is it gonna, you know, free him up and he's gonna become more effective whenever he does do, maybe it'll have his whole game flourish as to where he's going to be such a suddenly a dominant playmaker as well, making the right passes, shooting, scoring, you know, almost being an all-star again. So, you know, I, I can get what they're going at. They're playing that kind of, let, hey, Drew, you don't have any kind of responsibility. You know, just shoot your open shots, do this, do that, defend your man. But they, they're, the, I think the hope is they allow him to just concentrate on those few things. Maybe the rest of his game will follow. And I might be remembering this incorrectly. Uh, the Denver Nuggets game where we lost 134 to 131. I remember, I think we had a lead going into the final minute. And then Drew Holiday, like you said, he bounced the ball off of his shin. Then it was 131 to 131. Or maybe it was 134 to 131. But we still had a chance to to hit a three to tie. And he had another careless turnover. Uh, two weeks before that, uh, Kawhi Leonard just straight up picked his pocket. I think the game was tied again with a minute left. And it, it just looked like, just looked like he wasn't all there, that he wasn't relaxed, a little too much stress. He's a great player, but maybe he can't he can't handle all of this, and that's why they brought in somebody like Rondo. They're giving more responsibility to, to Marcus Cousins. But it's definitely concerning. Of course, we don't know what was going on with Lorne and his family. Some of the comments that Del Dempsey and Alvin Gentry had on uh, Duncan Holder last week was how that, you know, all that stuff has been resolved. Everybody's healthy and happy, and what a difference that's going to make this season. So I definitely do hope that, uh, that all this uh, experiment has to say – does pay off as as the ringer uh would have right. it. Preston, let me just add this though. I don't think Drew Holiday had any kind of fun whatsoever last year. And you know, that's the bottom line in this game. You gotta have fun. That's when you're gonna be at your best. But honestly, I don't think Drew had any. And with each, you know, turnover or whatever that happened, it kind of added more to his plate. That's why I came to defense to him late in the season in an article saying, look guys, everybody, you know, I remember I'm sure you remember everybody's piling on this guy left and right. He's terrible. He sucks. The Pelicans, if they resign them, they're idiots. I took the opposite approach. I think he was he just had this type of season where it was the perfect storm. It 
He's coming off two years of, you know, injury problems with his leg. Now it's a family issue. And, you know, we've all had stress in our lives. And I've read as to where professional athletes, it's like almost time at 10. And you know what? Maybe, maybe Drew didn't handle it. And so, voila, he got hit with that. And what we saw were the results from all that stress. If this guy just goes back to having fun, and it sounds like that's what the Pelicans want to do. It, it it could just turn, you know, everything could do a 180 and all of a sudden he's going to be that all-star form we saw in Philly. So I, I just want to point out that people are saying whether it's in him, whether he's capable. I don't think that's necessarily it. You also have to look from the standpoint of, of his um, everything on his shoulders in terms of stress, in terms of his family life, everything. He just had no fun. And when you, and when you're not, when it becomes such a chore, I can see why he cracked under pressure so many times. So it's not that he can't do it. I think there are so many extenuating circumstances that nobody gives enough credit for that we should, you know, we should remind people of this. That's why I always come to his aid. That's why, why I'm saying right now, I think there's more to his game. I think we can truly expect more out of him if he's in a happier place. I, I don't want to disagree with you because you're absolutely right. Uh, how could anybody understand how how to deal with uh, some of the things like that happening in your personal life? Of course, I would have no way to relate. Um, the 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 one I don't want to say argument. The one thing I will say is the Pelicans handled this really well last year, in that it, it seemed at least publicly that they were telling him to stay away as long as he needed to to recover to take care of his family. And obviously the Pelicans were in a tough spot. I think they were uh, 0-8 at the time, 2-12 at the time when he came back, something like that. I, I'm, I'm not looking at basketball reference. But with that being said, Drew Holiday chose to came back, come back. His family wanted him to come back. Um, so if it, if it was that difficult, I, I wish for everybody's sake he, he would have just stayed out of it. Now, you know, obviously it, made a, it might have been a mistake. Maybe he came back too early, all that sort of stuff. But you definitely have a point. It definitely was affected in his free throw percentage, which was very telling. It was a, a career low for him. So I definitely. But let's move on because I, I don't want to say something that I'm going to regret here. I definitely want him and his family. Before we move on, though, can I can I uh, say a couple? Definitely. Of things? Okay. Yeah, I agree with all, a lot of what Holly just said. I mean, that's very true. And when you're trying to evaluate Holiday, and I think it's one thing also. Um, when you're looking at Etwan Moore, one thing to think about is how at the beginning of the season there was no Drew Holiday, and the focus was feeding AD and just getting deferring constantly to AD. We saw him putting up those crazy numbers at the end of the year. It's because everybody was just getting him the ball. And so I think it took some of the aggressiveness out of Etwan Moore, and then also he was suffering from a heel injury which slowed him down a little bit. But then yeah, he missed after games, you're making right, the trade for Boogie, uh, then it also became, you know, get those two work. The focus now is making that relationship work. Those two guys are on court. So well, I think Etwan Moore, if he's, if we go through a training camp with this roster and it's all about sharing and taking the shot when you got it, I think you're going to see a much improved Etwan Moore this year. And then the other thing I want to touch on also is the boogie comments uh, that we're talking about. And I, I'm super excited about this because think about the history of New Orleans basketball. Think of the stars that we've had here. Initially, Baron Davis was the star on this team, and he never really embraced the city. And there, and it, it was never like he, he never felt like he was super excited to be here. Then you enter in the Chris Paul era, and he he wasn't really even like a guy that really seemed that excited about being in New Orleans. I mean, people say that he did, I mean, he did a lot of community work here and all of that stuff, but it never felt like he was like 100%, this is my home. And then, you know, of course, we had turmoil with ownership and things like that, which also soured the relationship. And then now, like, uh, you know, before Boogie, our two big players were Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday. And as as exciting as Anthony Davis is on the court, he's just as boring off the court. You know, like, he, you know, he's a great guy. He obviously loves the city. That's not in question. But just personality wise, he's not like this super personality. And then Drew Holiday also, like, I mean, like, 
you're talking about exciting excitement about all these guys working out together and all these quotes we're getting from all these players. Where is the $126 million man in all this? We haven't heard him say anything. We haven't heard of him working out with these guys, you know, so there's that. And then you got Boogie, who is a guy who's been known for his whole career to be a malcontent and dissatisfied and all of this. And now he's here and he's just so excited and so chomping at the bit to get this rolling. It's just like refreshing and exciting to have that personality in New Orleans finally on this basketball team. All right, let's wrap this up, Ali. Um, I just want to go over some comments that Chris Finch had uh, this week. And he said, in order to use both player skill sets in regards to AD and DeMarcus Cousins, the team is going to have to give them a lot of freedom. He expects them to play Cousins and AD at the top of the floor and have them make plays in their own unique way. Cousins as the elite passer and AD as continuously improving ball handler. Now, the reason I bring this up is, uh, you know, now we've got Rajon Rondo on the team and we've got Drew Holiday on the team and everybody's going to be out on the perimeter. How is this going to work? Yeah, great question, first of all, because I've given this thought as soon as we got Rondo. How I think it's going to work, Preston, is the Pelicans, as soon as they grab possession of the ball on the defensive end with a defensive rebound, they're going to look to push the ball. Now, first option, hopefully, will be through the pass. You know, you just move it up just like Denver used to do last year. They got that ball from one rim to the other without as so much as one dribble. I think that's going to be the first option for the Pelicans. The second one is going to be you get the ball in Rondo's hands. This guy still has that speed, and his vision is still as what it was when he was at the top of his game in Boston. So the next three, four, five seconds of the shot clock, let's see if Rondo can get, get us an easy basket. If not, once they go into their offense, that's when I think you're going to see Boogie go ahead and get the ball maybe you know, 30 40% of the time at the top of the key or maybe whatever they've got playing for Davis. Then that, that's when they're going to run some set offenses, and hopefully that's when we'll see a lot of cuts because uh, I've noticed Rondo, he's got some cutting ability too. So playing him off the ball isn't the worst idea when all these guys are on the move. So when everybody says, God, how's it going to work? How's, how's this, you know, most of these guys are not good long-range perimeter shooters. I think there's a tier that they're looking at, a quick strike. If not, let's see if Rondo can do something. If not, let's get in our offense, run something, run some plays. You know, I, I really can see it working if everybody buys in. That's why you know, such, you know, cliche thing to say buying in, but it's true. If you've got one player, one superstar that is just looking for his, none of this would ever work. But if Boogie's buying in AD as to where they're going to trust some other guys to make plays first, um, they may go three, four, five, six possessions without a touch. But if, if, if the team's successful, you know, they're not going to say a damn thing about it. You know, they're not going to complain. I think these guys are in it. They want to win. So I can see this working. It's going to be so interesting Preston watching how this unfolds in preseason um, and granted it's probably not going to be till the last game or so once they start getting serious but I can see this working you know I I, I'm, I don't have too many concerns people talking about the ill-fitting pieces because as soon as something's not working hey look on the bench we've got nothing but shooters sitting over there so they, they Gentry can go ahead and make a change if need be if a defense is suddenly not giving us those transition opportunities or whatever it may be. Kevin, uh, another another comment uh, to go along with what Ali said about, you know, having positionless players, uh, multiple ball handlers, multiple attackers. That's going to allow the, the the team to play with randomness, so to speak. Uh, speaking about about Rondo, uh, Finch said that that Rondo is going to help uh, spot mismatches and control tempo and flow as well as help the team close games. He described himself in Gentry as not being big play call guys. They both prefer to play through flow but when you need to call plays Rondo is the guy who can do this by the way I'm taking this all from Mason Ginsburg's article on Bourbon Street Shots in regards to the interview with Chris Gordy uh, and Chris Finch that's where I'm getting this information go and check it out he also emphasized the importance of uh, willingness to pass the ball saying that when you play with great passing players you want to pass the ball and if the team can master that then it will have something special now my question for you is this is giving a lot of control to Rajon Rondo. And this is where he ran into trouble with Rick Carlisle. Obviously, uh, where it's different, Alvin Gentry and Chris Finch say they don't need to call plays. They're, they're allowing their, their players to, to choose the plays for themselves. But with somebody uh, as strong-willed as Rajon Rondo on the floor with other personalities like Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins, do you trust Rajon Rondo to make the right decisions, play in, play out? I mean, I do. Like... Initially, I didn't want to. 
I, I wasn't into the idea of signing Rondo just because I thought it was going to be for a much higher uh, payday than it was. Now I'm very much on board with it because it's very low risk. You know, it's $3 million for one year. If, it, if it's not working, you can just trade them or dump them, whatever, you know. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if you're going to be playing small, he gives you that rebounding that you need. Um, but also in terms of IQ, he's a very smart guy. He's a very, um, you know, his basketball IQ is incredible. And he also, the thing with him and Carlisle, Carlisle and Gentry are very different personalities, you know. So I don't see him butting heads with, with Alvin Gentry very much or Alvin Gentry questioning him all that much on the court. I mean, you're talking about a guy, Rondo has championship pedigree. He's got, you know, he's a great passer. He sees the floor very well. And he's he's not a selfish player. And I think that's where issues come come in it, with, uh, you know, if if it was like, you know, say if we had gotten Eric Bledsoe, who I would prefer, obviously, but he might, he's more of a guy that's going to try to get his more often than Rondo is going to try to get his. So then you might run the risk of like butting heads uh, with Anthony Davis or DeMarcus Cousins. But Rondo is a totally selfless selfless passer like he wants to make he wants to make himself look good by making everybody else look good he he's a guy that chased assist numbers so he's uh you know trying to get the ball moving trying to get other players to score so I don't see that being a problem at all Kevin what do you hope to see from Game of Thrones this Sunday you know I'm still behind because uh I'm one episode behind but I'm going to catch up uh so I, I can't make a prediction on the next one. Okay, you've got two days left to catch up. Ali, uh, you gave us a little uh, inside peek on what we're going to have coming up on thebirdrights.com. Can you go into that again? Sure. My Darius Miller piece has gotten pushed back a little bit thanks to the Ian Clark signing, which is not bad news. It's always good to add some more talent, right? Um, yeah. I want to touch on Darius Miller, but I also want to get to this whole Pelicans are still on the outside looking in on the playoff picture coming up. Um, I've already started doing some research, and you know what? History is on the Pelicans' side. I'm just going to simply say that all NBA players, when they're grouped together, two of them on the same team, that have earned the award in the last three years, I want to say it's over 90% that that team gets to the postseason. So I'm going to try and do all that research, piling in that, and then we're going to start breaking down in a lot more stuff on, on why we think the Pelicans are going to, you know, get, get in the playoffs because that's the bottom line. That's what we're all looking for, and, you know, that's where the expectations lay. You guys have been listening to Ali Cassell. He's at Red Hopeful. And Kevin, you can find him at Kevin B for Bounce. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. For all you guys, don't forget to check out our most recent podcast with Travis Tate and Mason Ginsburg. And we're going to keep these uh, coming for you throughout the the offseason. So don't go anywhere. Make sure you go to thebirdrights.com. If you have a second, retweet this. Share it with a friend. Go on iTunes. Give us a rating. We really appreciate all the help that you guys give. Don't forget to check out Game of Thrones on Sunday. You never know when we're going to talk about it on the podcast. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Let's go, pals.